Hi everyone, I'm Deja Harwood, Executive Director of this beautiful Santa Barbara Historical Museum and a big warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. So, <laughs> I see waving happy over there, which is always fun. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge really quickly that um, we have a trustee in the room, Sheila Snow. And also our wonderful and supportive president, Hillary Burkemper. I know we have a lot of members in the room. Will you guys just give yourselves a big cheer, please? Yeah. It is because of you that we can host programs like this, so thank you so much. Please encourage your friends to become members of the museum as well. And I am going to go ahead and introduce our two wonderful speakers for tonight. So first of all, we have Lee Chiakos, who I think many people in this room know, by the way. Lee was... There's a lot of Lee's friends here in the audience, which is wonderful. Uh, Lee was born in San Diego, and he's lived in Santa Barbara since 1971. He's written and collected the stories of the ever-popular and sold-out history book, Mountain Drive, which I just heard is available online from Chris, so I'll let him tell you more about that. Um, since 1988, uh, his articles have been published in Santa Barbara Magazine, Montecito Magazine, The Independent, and others, including a regular, regular column in the old news press um, called uh, Then and Now. And he has led many walking tours and special interest tours here in Santa Barbara, in the greater region of Santa Barbara, I should say. And he is a husband, a father, and a grandfather. I also have the pleasure of introducing one of my team members tonight, Chris Irvin. Chris is the head archivist of the Goodhill Library. He received his Master's of Library and Information Science at San Jose State University in 2013, following a 30-year career in IT, and I'm very grateful that he decided to change tracks and end up here at the Historical Museum. He's really revolutionized our Goodhill Library, um, and he continues to do that for other institutions as well. I think most importantly tonight, I actually need to acknowledge his wife, Leslie Irvin, who really makes all of this possible. So everyone, could you please give a round of applause to Leslie? And with that, I will introduce my head archivist, Chris Irvin. Thank you, Daisha. Good evening, everyone. As mentioned, I'm Chris, Chris Irvin, head archivist for the Glad Hill Library here at the museum. Before we get started, uh, I'd like to thank the people who've made Memories of Mountain Drive, the exhibit behind me, possible. George Burtness, Kathy Brewster, Peter Feldman, Brigida Forsell, Kathy Neely, Ziggy Peak, and Rob Robinson, uh, many of those names uh, donated a lot of the artifacts that we have uh, in the exhibit. I'd also like to thank our staff who contributed to the curation of the exhibit. Emily Alessio, Jim Grippo, Adela Lasanti, and Michelle Blum. And I need to thank Lee Chiakos for his book on Mountain Drive and for his collaboration, uh, which has made, was key to making this exhibition a reality. And uh, finally, I, I especially want to thank our executive director, Daisha, for her amazing leadership, steadfast support for this project for the last two and a half years. So, um, okay. So anyway, let, let's get started here. So Lee and I are each going to talk for about 20 minutes, uh, followed by a question and answer period, if anyone can stand that. And I'll now hand over the podium to my co-presenter, Lee Chiakos. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad you could be here. My interest in history began when I was young as a search for meaning. 
In my 20s, I read everything by local author Walker Tompkins about Santa Barbara. I loved the way he told stories that made the present, the place names of our region, and the people of our past vivid and meaningful. The old saying, all history is local history, rang true to me. I also loved to read nonfiction from an early age, and writing came out of that. The true stories of life, often sad, um, eclipse the imagination of even the most creative fiction writers. In 1988, I responded to an invitation to the Santa Barbara community from David McCumber, the new editor of the News Press, to submit a garden column. From that group of writers, three were chosen to continue writing for the News Press to replace the gardening column of Gil Johnston, columnist and mountain driver who was retiring. I was one of the three chosen for the job. After some tutelage from my English professor neighbor, Bob Brantz, and with a little help from the classic book on writing, Strunk and White's <laughs> Elements of Style, I was off. As a lifetime avid gardener, I thoroughly enjoyed writing the column and also my friendship with David. He soon asked me to write a local history column that I called Then and Now. I enjoyed giving context to the buildings, place names, and pieces of the past still visible in the present. Then, after a trip to Santa Fe, New Mexico with my wife Donna, wherein we went on a guided walking tour of the historic town, I decided to start a walking tour of Santa Barbara and called it Walking Tours Through History. I had formerly taken walking tours in England and Greece and found it enriched my experience of historic sites. The le this led to over 20 years of leading all kinds of tours all through the county, including wine tours, Jeep tours, ranch tours, and events of all kinds. In 1990, my life changed when the Painted Cave Fire, is, is it possible to make it less echoey? Or is that just how it is? Maybe you can hear me better without it. I don't know. Closer? Okay. Closer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in 1990, my life changed when the Painted Cave Fire burned our house in San Marcos Trout Club. Soon after that, changes of management at the news press caused them to eliminate the local writers and artists. That was a double whammy. The good news was that the settlement with Allstate Insurance Company provided a type of employment to me to build a new house, which became our family home for over 30 years. And I kept growing my tour business as well. As a resident of Santa Barbara since 1971, I've made friends with some people who were raised on Mountain Drive, East Mountain Drive. One of my first friends was Chris Neely. We were neighbors on West Mountain Drive at El Rancho Hacienda. As a result, I have visited East Mountain Drive many times through the years. I found the people of the drive to be creative, resourceful, and humorous. Their homes and gardens were full of art and joy. Chris had a family album that his father Bill had made, and some of the other residents showed me the things like the grapevine newsletter, handmade pottery, and drums, and they talked about how a book should be written about Mountain Drive. I don't remember exactly how it happened, but at some time around 1993, Mountain Drive residents George Grayson and Marty Birdsell took a particular interest in helping me to put the book together. And Frank Goad was able to make the text and photos into pages on his computer. And so the project began. I spent about six months interviewing people, engaging photographers Julia Emerson and Ishmael Lounsbury, who photographed people and places on Mountain Drive. My son Michael helped by transcribing excerpts from the Grapevine newsletters, and friends Carrie Tomlinson and Jeannie Class made edits. I collected the material and edited it all down to tell the story. I thought it turned out pretty well for a little local history book, 
and I didn't expect it to still be popular 30 years later, but it is gratifying, especially because so many of the drive's elders have passed on now. One senior member of the community and reader of the book commented, Chacos wasn't there, but he got it right. One day in 2021, while I was out at our place in New Mexico, I got a call from the new archivist at the Santa Barbara Historical Museum. Chris Irvin told me how much he enjoyed the book and told me of his discovery of the Mountain Drive oral history tapes. He enjoyed listening to them and planned to put all the material about the community onto a website. He wanted to know if I had photographs he could scan for the project. I told him I would be back in Santa Barbara in the fall and would contact him. About that time, same time, I got a call from the publisher and distributor of the Mountain Drive book, Michael Zolkowski of Pacific Books. He wanted me to know he was retiring and that the second printing was almost sold out and that if I wanted to take it over, it was mine. When I got home, I made some phone calls and met with Kathy Neely and Michael Peake's son, Ziggy Peak. I brought a big pile of pictures to Chris and our collaboration and friendship began. Soon he discussed the possibility of a show at the museum with Daisha and the rest is history. Recently, Chris scanned a copy of the book and it is now digital and downloadable from the museum's website. So anybody who wants a copy that doesn't have one, they're out of print, so they're kind of hard to find, but you can download it. Now I would like to read sections of my book so that I can share some thoughts from the time of documenting the story of Mountain Drive back in the early 90s. And hopefully together we can appreciate the original inspiration of this meaningful moment in Santa Barbara's history. First, to further understand the spirit that led to the founding of the Mountain Drive community, a short history of the Bohemian movement in California and how it applied to our local history may provide perspective. Then I will read the introduction and afterword of the book. Most of the founders had recently either been discharged from the armed forces or had otherwise experienced the trauma of World War II. The post-war environment was one of extreme polarization between communists and capitalists. Those who disagreed with the status quo, such as Bobby Hyde, found themselves on the fringe of mainstream American society. Bobby had traveled and been educated in Europe and was much influenced both by his experiences abroad and in New York in the 1920s. Lydia Tonetti, his former wife, um, was the daughter of a sculptor. The Tonetti family lived in an artist's commune in New York. Bobby had experienced the Bohemian influence on both European and American culture and identified with it. This quote from author Nige Lennon in his book, Mark Twain in California, sums it up. Originating in Paris and continuing in New York, 19th century Bohemianism was a philosophy embracing Dionysian principles in an era of stern Calvinist morality. While the conventional wisdom of the era admonished its adherents to be circumspect, severe, frugal, and chaste, those who followed a bohemian way of life, joyfully rank, drank to excess, flew in the face of prevalent sexual strictures, loudly proclaimed political opinions that were generally radical, and had a devil-may-care communal attitude toward living arrangements and money. That's from, from uh, Nike. The homegrown Santa Barbara bohemianism of the 50s sometimes imitated the Parisian and New York styles and aspects of this movement found expression on Mountain Drive. Some residents wore berets, and you, some of you might remember seeing Frank Robinson in his beret walking around near his studio in De La Guerra Adobe. 
with a big smile, of course. <laughs> they have, these residents also affected some beat mannerisms and slang, but the overarching presence of the rugged, sun-baked hillside overlooking the Pacific, with the Channel Islands floating in the distance, produced a cultural hybrid which is distinctly Santa Barbaran. And during the 60s, beat generation poets from Sausalito and the San Francisco Bay Area, as well as philosophers and musicians such as Philip Whelan, Timothy Leary, Alan Watts, Peter King, Joan Baez, and John Cage visited Mountain Drive. And now I'm going to read the introduction, which is now 30 years old. Though much of the early history Drive community is wreathed in legend. Some stories recur often enough to provide a few dependable facts. Everyone seems to agree that Bobby Hyde, born in 1900, a writer and son of a Santa Barbara artist, instigated the plan to create the community based on his desire to live an unconventional life close to the land and in the company of those of like mind. To this end, he and his wife Florence, widely known as Floppy, purchased 50 acres of rugged, fire-blackened land in the hills above Santa Barbara. They proceeded to parcel it out by the acre to relatives and newfound friends in the post-war 40s and 50s. From numerous interviews with these early settlers and their descendants, along with the gathering of photographs and memorabilia, this volume brings together reflections of Bobby Hyde's idealism and the aspirations of young people to make a unique life for themselves and their families. The traditions they started have resulted in such now familiar California folk customs as the communal hot tub soak, the Renaissance pleasure fair, Santa Barbara's fine crafts movement, early music revival, and summer solstice parade, as well as renewed interest in adobe house construction. With a respect for the ancient traditions of pagan Europe and classical Greece, tempered by a bawdy sense of humor, the mountain drivers secured a place in history. Theirs was a community based on individual land ownership with a cooperative spirit. They helped each other build and bought some commodities together in bulk, like York Mountain wine, which fueled their engines and sometimes caused husbands and wives to be exchanged in the process. They argued, fought, and ignored each other. They had no religious doctrine, but let the ancients, the innovative, and their intuition inspire them and the rugged but beautiful landscape influenced them fully. Fire and flood, raging winds and heat, poor clay soil, and the limitations of their inexperience inhibited their early homesteading efforts, but they persisted and they learned. In my attempt to put a tidy beginning, middle, and end on the tale of Mountain Drive, I was thwarted at every turn by an inexhaustible source of entertaining information. Everyone I spoke with about the project added a story, a name of someone who must be contacted, or a personal memory. In tracking down former residents, I found them widely dispersed from Santa Barbara to Santa Cruz, San Francisco, Mendocino, Montana, Costa Rica, Paris, and beyond. Editing all the available material so that it might squeeze between the covers of this book proved quite a challenge. Consequently, some players and parts of the story have been left out. The community, which began with Bobby and Floppy Hyde's purchase of land on Mountain Drive in 1940, has led to a complex social organization which has now spanned half a century. And we have to update that to 80 years and included hundreds of residents. In the late 1940s and early 50s, the first residents camped on their newly acquired property in tents and temporary structures while they built their homes. 
The highly individualistic houses they constructed on the lofty slopes varied in style, but shared the elements of native sandstone, wood, adobe, and creative masonry. The heavy bricks of adobe soil, high in clay content, taken from the site, were made following the ancient tradition brought to California by the Spanish in the 1700s. They were made by pouring clay mud into wooden molds approximately 18 inches long, 8 inches wide, and 4 inches thick. The builders strengthened the clay with an asphalt emulsion that provided waterproofing and dried them in the sun. The bricks were then mortared in place on the walls with cement on a mortared sandstone foundation. The old style of adobe brick was bolstered with straw pine needles or dung, and mortared with mud. Eucalyptus trees and other, uh, and other trees planted in the 1950s have grown into a thick grove in the area, and gardens with fruit and flowers surround the old houses, which still stand, a couple of them, <laughs> overlooking Santa Barbara, the Pacific Ocean, and the Channel Islands. The winding road to the city of Santa Barbara threads about four miles through a sycamore and oak-studded canyon new, now lined with homes. Mountain Drive's influence on California's post-World War II culture has been considerable. This volume documents a portion of its history, traces the sources of its inspiration, and attempts to retrieve and collate images and anecdotes from the beginnings of the community in the 1940s and the early years up to about 1968. Bobby Hyde died in 1969. A good deal of material has been lost to fire, flood, insects, rodents, and other assorted vagaries of nature and human behavior. Like a mountain drive potluck, it is a true collaboration of some longtime residents who put together their memories, writings, and photographs. I enjoyed the process of making this volume immensely, and I only hope that the spirit of the drive will continue to inspire many generations. And then the, lastly, the afterword, which I think adds some, some more uh, context. Time passes with it. A time, time passes, and with it, everything changes. The glory days of Mountain Drive, when innocence had not yet become notoriety, have alas passed into legend. But uh, lest we wax sentimental about the end of the pot wars and the wine stomp's naked revelry, let us also remember that lack of discipline and order could make life difficult for many of its inhabitants. Like any other American neighborhood in the 50s and 60s, alcoholism, drug abuse, divorce, childish selfishness, and economic struggle took their toll. The mountain driver's gallant effort to thwart the forces of drab conformity, venture into free love alternative lifestyles, and embrace joyous hedonism, eventually succumb to a more conservative style. Such is the way of the world. Idealism is co-opted, commercialized, or simply trampled to death. Montecito's opulence has pushed up from the flatlands, and the drive now includes large stucco houses among the old dwellings of the early days. Volkswagens now share Coyote Road with Jaguars and BMWs. The celebrations are a little more subdued. Nudity is no longer de rigueur. But the spirit of the drive of the legendary Bobby and Floppy Hyde lives on. The current residents strive to honor the traditions, the customs, and the memories of a community that recognizes the joy that is life without the restrictions that a crowded and acquisitive world impose. May the old mountain driver's sense of community, of living without constant artificial stimulation, canned music, prepackaged food, electronic entertainment, and mass consumerism spread to a thousand neighborhoods. May the inhabitants of the land kill their TVs, dig up their lawns for food and flower gardens, and make wine, soak in hot tubs, play music, dance, 
and celebrate this fleeting play we call life. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. I'm often asked what an archivist does. Here at the Gledhill Library of the Historical Museum, it's my job to preserve the materials that tell the story of Santa Barbara and to make those materials available to the community. Full disclosure, I did not grow up in Santa Barbara, but my wife did, and her mother, and her mother's mother. My wife, Leslie, likes to remind me that Santa Barbara is the home to many firsts in California. The first insulin treatment. The first Motel 6. <laughs> and the first Egg McMuffin. Having grown up in homogenous Los Angeles and Orange Counties, uh, I, suburbs, I found Leslie's pride in the accomplishments of her hometown to be charming. But as I have grown to understand Santa Barbara over the past six years, I found local innovations to be almost common. My immersion into the history of the Mountain Drive phenomenon has reinforced for me the pervasiveness of local innovation in Santa Barbara. The Bohemian community of, Santa, of <laughs> Mountain Drive of the 1950s and 1960s is credited with rekindling an interest in building homes with adobe, popularizing traditional music forms of Renaissance, bluegrass, and bagpipes, reviving local winemaking, and popularizing the do-it-yourself hot tub. <laughs> also providing the inspirational elements for the Renaissance Fair. And all along the way, these everyday human activities were infused with a sense of play, um, as Lee says, a body sense of humor, and clothing optional. Together, these traditions created and sustained by the inhabitants of an isolated neighborhood just four miles from downtown make Mountain Drive an essential feature of Santa Barbara history. As an archivist, it's my job to save our history and to make it accessible. The Gledhill Library, the research department of the museum, handles about 900 inquiries each year from the community it's one such inquiry that led me to our collection of Mountain Drive oral histories. Two and a half years ago, a young woman contacted us wanting to hear an interview done with her grandmother, who had passed away 10 years earlier. I was still becoming familiar with our collections and had to do some digging to find the interview. It was one of about two dozen that had been done 35 years ago, um, actually earlier, and they were still on the original audio cassette tapes. We eventually got the tapes digitized and transcribed, and about a year later, I was able to recontact the young lady and give her a link to the now accessible interview done with her grandmother. Now, not every one of our 900 inquiries per year gets that kind of attention, but when I opened the box of Mountain Drive interviews and learned a little bit about its history, I knew we had stumbled across one of the museum's hidden gems. What really drove that home was reading the book Mountain Drive. My co-presenter Lee did a fabulous job of that. Um, I've told him many times that I consider it the literary roadmap to Mountain Drive uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Robert McKee Hyde, better known as Bobby Hyde, was the son of Robert Wilson Hyde, a businessman who for many years owned the Hyde Antique Studio in the Hill Carrillo Adobe on East Carrillo Street. The Hill Carrillo Adobe was known as a lively center of the community's artists, musicians, writers, and unofficial city planners. It was there that committees and groups met to talk and plan for the revival of interest in Spanish-style type of architecture for Santa Barbara, 
and for people interested in building a new community theater on the site of Jose Libero's old opera house. This is the eclectic environment that Bobby Hyde grew up in. On top of that, both of the senior and junior Robert Hydes were local chess champions in the 1930s. Here is Marty Birdsell remembering how he became acquainted with Bobby Hyde. But in the early 60s one time, I, you know, I got sort of close to him. At, uh, there was a Bobby Fisher came to Santa Barbara to play chess. And about 52 people showed up at the recreation center. And this was about maybe 62, 60, around that time. Bobby Fisher at the time was only about 20, around 20 years old. And uh, Bobby Hyde was one of the per people who played chess with Bobby Fisher, uh, uh, you know, amongst the, the other 50 people. <laughs> so. Anyway, I, I think I got to know him that night because I was there too, and it was interesting. Needless to say, Bobby Fisher, you know, put enough people away in that short a period of, a rather short period of time. But I do recall Bobby Hyde lasting for quite. A bit. He was maybe one of the last ones to get beaten. Oral history is a documentation technique for capturing first-hand accounts from people who otherwise would not leave behind a record of their activities and accomplishments. It's been a popular tool for over 60 years, yet the analog nature of magnetic tape has made the, uh, that information difficult to access quickly and efficiently. Because of that challenge, oral histories have been useful to only the most dedicated researchers. But with the advent of personal computers, sophisticated software, Combined with the reach of the internet, these amazing records of people's lives are much easier to use and explore today. Bobby Hyde died in 1969 at the age of 69, a good 20 years before we began collecting the oral histories of Mountain Drive. So we did not capture his voice or his thoughts on why he developed Mountain Drive into a place that attracted creative people the same type of people who would gather in his father's antique shop and when he was growing up. But we can piece together what drove Bobby Hyde by listening to the people who knew him, who bought land from him, and who had conversations with him. One of those people is Bobby's youngest son, Gavin. This is Gavin Hyde talking about his father selling land on Mountain Drive. He had always been a utopian. Uh, he talked about utopias a lot. He said that the land chooses the people. He said realtors think that people come and they take them out and they choose places to live. He said that's not true. It's just the opposite. That the place chooses the people. And he said that's why I'm not afraid to put an ad in the paper downtown that I'm selling acres for $50 down and $50 a month. It was $2,000 an acre. And when people came up, if they weren't the right type of people, the land would tell them to go away. <laughs> and it did work to a certain extent because people would come and uh, some of them would just immediately express how terrible it was, you know, that all of this is just covered with brush, you know, which any thought the brush was wonderful. Yes, you could buy an acre of land from Bobby Hyde for $2,000 using the Bobby Hyde Easy Payment Plan. No realtors or escrow companies were involved. And what are those acres worth today? 1,000 times that easily. So Utopia ended up being a pretty good investment. Some mountain drivers served during World War II. In the early 1950s, these veterans were still young men in their late 20s and early 30s. They came to Santa Barbara to go to school at the Santa Barbara State College when it was still on the Riviera campus, the school campus that later became UCSB and before it moved out to Goleta. Architect and mountain driver Frank Robinson was the first student to graduate with a degree in the new philosophy program there. 
the barracks at Hoff Heights Army Hospital, where the municipal golf course is today, had been converted into a village where veterans could get two meals a day on a cot. It was a good deal. Gil Johnston, who wrote Gil the Gardener for the news press, was one of these veterans turned student. At the Riviera campus, he met Bobby Hyde's stepson, Oliver Andrews, who was a sculptor and who had built his own home and studio on Mountain Drive. Andrews invited Gil Johnston up to meet his parents, Bobby and Floppy Hyde. Mountain Drive appealed to a certain type of do-it-yourselfer, people who were self-reliant. These are people who had fought in the Pacific and were not easily intimidated by the adversity of brush on the hillside. <laughs> Gil had this to say about Bobby, who would eventually sell him an acre of land. I, I was very much in awe of him when we first came here. Bobby, uh, there was the rascal in him. He was bright. And, uh, I think the thing I liked about Bobby uh, was that when we first came up here, uh, I had the feeling that whatever I wanted to do was okay. And if I wanted to, uh, I built onto the house that, that, uh, that we rented from him, and he supplied the lumber. It was there in, in, in his yard. He, they had over, there was one section up there, it was all brush. It was just, there were paths going through the brush leading to old refrigerators and, and, and stoves that, that uh, there, there was a certain air of distinction about that place. It, it looked like a great junkyard, but, but it was different. It was okay. And, and uh, it put you uh, sort of, well, God knows you, you didn't want to be bourgeois and, 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 and the downtown and, and insist upon everything being clean and so forth. Another mountain driver Teacher Merv Lane also shares his impressions of Bobby Hyde. Well, that's the way I got to build my house is uh, Bobby, we, we looked for rental. We found a rental in the foothills and uh, it was his rental. And uh, it was sort of peculiar because nothing worked. And uh, yet the rent was very low. Mm -hmm. We met him and uh, a, a number of the other neighbors because every Saturday he had a party and uh, we, uh, he got to like us. He especially liked uh, people who were somewhat opposed to the established way of doing things and could do things on their own and use their own minds and hands and brains. And uh, he encouraged us to think about buying a piece of property up here because it was very, very inexpensive. So after I was here for about eight months, uh, I just I bought the piece that you're sitting on, which is an acre parcel, and uh, it was, uh, he encouraged me to, to uh, build, and he was very helpful to all the people in the area here. He uh, lent out his equipment, he came up and helped you if you didn't know what you were doing. Mm -hmm. He had tools, he had various, he was a well digger by trade, and uh, he also uh, was a writer, and uh, he, he would try his hand at anything, uh, you know, he, he, he was very, very, uh, innovative and original. One of the topics that unifies nearly all of the Mountain Drive interviews is music. The exhibition displays musical instruments played on Mountain Drive 60 to 70 years ago. Instruments such as Peter Feldman's banjo and Bill Neely's concertina. Here is Bill Neely's son, Chris, on the subject of music. In my family, my father played uh, the violin and the cello, concertina and the piano and the guitar mm -hmm. and recorders. Mm -hmm. And he tried to teach us all. And then um, in the evenings, we all had a family orchestra where he would try and teach us all to play different instruments. Mm -hmm. So we played together. But at, at a party or a celebration, it didn't take much. There usually would be a couple of recorders, a tambourine, and my father's concertina, which tended to drown out everything. <laughs> and uh, that would that would be uh, be the party. And it, it didn't really take much music to get everybody dancing and singing. Mm -hmm. There was I remember constant singing. Everybody was always mm -hmm. singing mm -hmm. every get together. The musical aspect was always there. Was always music. And then there were the drums. I was a student at Westmont College, and I arrived about three weeks before the Coyote Fire in 1964. Um, I was 17, 
And the first remembrance I have of Mountain Drive were the drums, the drums, the drums. I'd never heard drums like that before. They're conga drums. People would have drums, uh, conga drums, out on their porch or patio or something. And somebody somewhere up and down the hill would start playing a riff. And somebody else might be inspired to go out. And pretty soon you'd have drums up and down the mountain, answering and playing and answering and playing, and joining together and then swirling and fading. It was very mystical and magic. Music was part of the fabric of Mountain Drive. Eric Katz, a German-born musicologist, composer, and professor who had fled the Nazis in 1939, became a driving force behind the early music and recorder movements in the United States. He also retired to one of Bobby Hyde's acres on Mountain Drive, where he organized a small musical group called Collegium Musicum, which practiced and performed Renaissance music. They even recorded a vinyl LP in 1965. Concerts of the Eric Katz Collegium Musicum Renaissance Music were performed in the 1960s at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, UCSB, and the Libero Theater, featuring primarily mountain drivers as the musicians and singers. Here's a little taste of 15th century music as played by mountain drive musicians nearly 60 years ago. I find that really beautiful. And uh, by the way, um, Rob, that's your mom, Peggy, singing. I'm sure you know that. Rob Robinson's here tonight. Mountain Drive was host to a variety of musical forms in the 1950s and 60s. The Scrag family played bluegrass with Peter Feldman on banjo, Kasha Oman on guitar, and Gene McGeorge on fiddle. In fact, the Scrag family is the soundtrack of our Mountain Drive exhibition. There were concerts of harp music by Floppy Hyde's son, Joel Andrews, performed in downtown Santa Barbara on Mountain Drive and around the country before he went on to specialize in improvising a new age style of therapeutic music for meditation and healing. There was the appearance of Santa Barbara's own Walter B. Truman's 7-Up Bagpipe Band at the annual Robert Burns birthday party held on Mountain Drive. <laughs> In honor of that memory, some of you may recall, bagpiper Tom Strelick made an appearance at the opening of our Mountain Drive exhibit here last October. Okay, so why do we care about oral histories anyway? History has traditionally captured the lives of the rich and well-connected males. Oral history allows us to democratize the, uh, his, the historical record by capturing the stories of ordinary people who've lived interesting but undocumented lives. Oral history gives us the means by which to capture stories that might otherwise be missed. It allows us a way to fill gaps in the historical record. For many Santa Barbarans, uh, we recall when, San when Elizabeth II, Queen of England, visited Santa Barbara in 1983. But how many people remember when the premier of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, visited Santa Barbara in 1959? After being denied entry to Disneyland, Khrushchev visited Santa Barbara <laughs> on an 18-car whistle-stop train tour. The Soviet premier got off the train at the depot for 13 minutes, passed out hammer and sickle lapel pins, and shook hands with the mayor. Here's how that event was remembered by Chris Neely when he was a boy growing up on Santa Bar on, uh, in Mountain Drive. I remember when Chris came here to Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I, Bobby Hyde took me down to see him with oh, Naomi. Really? Uh, yeah. And uh, Bobby held Naomi up on the shoulders and she waved to him. Chris came over and shook Naomi's hand and there was a picture of it in the newspaper. <laughs> all over the country. It was kind of neat. I just read uh, in the paper this morning that uh, today begins Wine Week. So it's appropriate we talk about the most well-known and legendary event on Mountain Drive, the Wine Stomp. 
In the early 50s, Bill Neely experimented with developing a vineyard on Mountain Drive. When the rocky soil of the Santa Inez foothills proved not suitable for growing grapes, he organized his neighbors each October to help him pick better grapes from elsewhere and bring them back to Mountain Drive. Here is his son, Chris, once again describing the grape pick. Originally, when my father made the wine with the, the whole community involved, we would go to the grape pick. And um, when it first started, it was either at Kinnevin Ranch or Ojai. But finally, he found an old farmer up near Paso Robles named Mel Castillo. Mm -hmm. And it was the most beautiful grape uh, vineyard. It's just a gorgeous area. The whole community would drive up there Friday night and camp out on Mel's huge front lawn. And they would have a big bonfire. And us kids would play in this huge tree behind the bonfire. Just next morning, we'd all get up and pick I think it was a ton of grapes that he usually picked. And I'm not sure what the types, I think Grenache and maybe some Zinfandel. And um, we picked the grapes, we'd be done picking by noon, and Mel Castillo would have gone out and shot a deer and barbecued it on his huge roasting mm -hmm. barbecue. And we'd all, the whole, be usually about 30 people. And uh, so we'd sit down to a huge feast, which is wonderful, with lots of singing and music. And lots of grape picks, those were fun and drive back down Saturday night. And then Sunday morning was the grape stop. And here is Sandy Hill walking us through the wine stomp itself. The grape pick was always done on a Saturday. At first we used to go to Ojai, to a man's vineyard named Lester Perano, and uh, pick our grapes and come back Saturday night and get everything in preparation for the next day. And the next morning, the men would get out early in Neely, uh, Neely's uh, wine cellar area and uh, or run the grapes through a um, wire to take the stems off, de-stem for the white wine. And that was quickly run through the presses and stored in large five-gallon jugs. And while they were doing that, they were considering um, the women who picked grapes the day before, who, who did the best job, and so on, who should be the queen. And uh, meanwhile, the women were making uh, wreaths from, uh, we, we clipped quite a few uh, grapevines from the vineyard, and formed them into wreaths, and did all the cooking, baking, etc., for the big lunch. And Sunday noon, there would be a large lunch on uh, long tables on the Neely's porch and at the end of lunch the queen would be crowned with one of the garlands which had been sprayed with gold paint. Then there was a parade from uh, Neely's porch down a sloping trail into this little uh, canyon area where the vat had been set up and all the red grapes had been dumped into a a mound and uh, the queen uh, after the ceremonial <laughs> would uh, remove her clothes and step into the vat and crush grapes. The wine stomp became such a defining tradition on Mountain Drive that the neighborhood even entered a float in the old Spanish Days Fiesta historical parade in 1963. It was titled La Vendemilla, or in English, the, wine, uh, the Vintage. It sported the Mountain Drive wine vat, wine barrels, an old wine press, likely the one from Santa Cruz Island, and baskets of grapes, which were actually stomped during the parade. It was, of course, it, it included music and dancing and even a burrow. The whole affair was pulled by Stan Hill on his tractor. <laughs> Stan Hill was a World War II fighter pilot who had a career as an optometrist in downtown Santa Barbara. Stan was one of these bright do-it-yourself guys who also got interested in home winemaking. At the same time, Pierre Lafond, who was originally an architect, he had won the winning design for the governor's mansion in Sacramento, was left a liquor store on the Mesa by his father. Lafon decided to switch careers and become a merchant. 
He wanted to start producing wine, but he couldn't afford a professional winemaker. So Stan Hill, the optometrist, who had been perfecting his own winemaking up on Mountain Drive, became Pierre Lafon's first winemaker. In 1965, Lafon's Santa Barbara Winery was credited with producing the first locally made commercial wine since the early 1930s. This is a news press photo of the Santa Barbara Winery on Yananali Street. That's Pierre Lafon in the middle, dumping grapes into the redwood vat, with Stan Hill behind him, ready to hand him the next lug of grapes. And Jack Bogle uh, is in the foreground, keeping the grapes moving. Uh, by the way, Jack also managed uh, Pierre Lafon's El Paseo Cellars. Uh, mountain drivers would gather on the patio at El Paseo at 5 p.m., and Jack would bring out bottles of whatever he had open for tastings. And lastly, we cannot visit Mountain Drive without also mentioning the hot tub. Here's Stan Hill describing how hot tubs got started. Yeah, the hot tubs started on Mountain Drive here too. A bunch of us used to go to uh, the hot springs, up Hot Springs Road here in Santa Barbara, which John Stack had caretaken for a while, was available to us, and then the Coyote Fire burned that out. In short, there are you know, really no hot springs available to us anymore. Well, by the time we'd been addicted to the, the whole spa scene, backcountry, rudimentary kind of way, it was lovely social occasion, you know. Uh, somehow, no clothes, a bunch of, uh, among a bunch of friends, uh, removed a lot of artificial garbage, and uh, it was neat. Anybody who had any ideas about anything sexual about it lost it pretty quick because it wasn't. It was just, it was just nice. Anyway, uh, upshot of the loss of these springs was that uh, we could make our own hot tubs, and, and everybody was into it. There were solar rigs. Bobby had coiled black hose on the roof of his house. Terribly inefficient, but it worked. But hot tubs were... It really started me, I mean, my connection with the winery in part because I... I had a source of uh, old redwood vats. I started rigging these things up into tubs. And there were a lot of wood-fired ones. and It eventually became more and more sophisticated. And, uh... Noel, Young, Noel Young went on to publish a very popular book on hot tubs under his Capra Press input, imprint. It got picked up by a national publisher and went into two expanded editions. Mountain Drive friends Gary Gordon and Richard Grant refined the Redwood hot tub design to make it available commercially. You can still buy one of their Gordon and Grant, you can still buy one of those hot tubs at Gordon and Grant's store on Haley Street. <laughs> Mountain Drive hot tubs also inspired a documentary short that it was screened at the 2010 Santa Barbara International Film Festival. Here's one of the last, if not the last, original Mountain Drive hot tubs on Mountain Drive, built by Michael and Laura Peake. Unlike many things on Mountain Drive, it somehow survived both the coyote and tea fires. So tonight, we've hit on just a few of the highlights that came out of Bobby Hyde's utopian experiment on Mountain Drive. We've seen, well, mainly heard, how oral history can expand our understanding of history, give it more dimension, and fill in gaps in the record. We've seen lasting innovations come out of Mountain Drive, a revival of traditional music forms, the rekindling of local winemaking, and the popularization of home hot tubs. If you're interested in exploring more of Mountain Drive, you can do so online with our handy QR code available uh, all around the museum here. And uh, anyway, I want to thank you all for coming this evening and uh, sharing this journey with us. I... Thank you.